Hello. Welcome to Thunder Fail, the interview show about tabletop games that are backed by people like you. Thunder Fail is part of the Indie Plus Network and adheres to the standards of that community. If you love independently created tabletop RPGs, check us out on Google+. In Thunder Fail, I will be bringing on a creator for a project that is currently available for funding at the, or backing at the time of recording. This may be through Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Patreon, or other fundraising platforms. Now, if you're looking for a project to back, or if you're looking at this project and want a little bit more information, you're in luck. I may or may not have backed these projects. It's my hope that this interview aids you, the viewer, with your funding decision for this project. If you have questions about this project and you're watching this Hangout on Air right now, I have enabled the Q&A. If you ask a legitimate question of the creator, once my gamut of questions have completed, and if that topic has not been addressed, then I will ask them your question. So please do get those questions in. Now, to put the next creator to the question. Tonight's guest is Chris Birch of Modifus Entertainment. Chris's current project is Mutant Chronicles 3rd Edition RPG. Funding for his project ends on Sunday, March 9th, 2014 at 4 p.m. Eastern. This is Chris's second Kickstarter project. Chris has backed 24 other Kickstarters. Welcome to Thunder Fail, Chris. How are you doing? Good, good. All right, so let's let's jump straight into this. Let's chat about what games you've made. What other projects have you managed before, and what was your involvement with them? Uh, well, I started off with Star Blazer Adventures, which is the Fate uh, space opera game based on the um, uh, Fate 3.0, I think. <laughs> and that was about a 600-page enormous book that I made with me, um, with Cubicle 7 back in um, about eight years ago, about kind of 2000. And I think actually I started writing it over the course of three years, and it came out about 2006. And then we did Legends of Anglaire, with Sarah Newton that I kind of managed the team and um, uh, and then co-wrote with Sarah and a huge range of very um, great writers um, and uh, that was the fantasy version of Star Blazer and then Acton Cthulhu last year. All right, all right. So let's uh, let's talk about Mutant Chronicles Third Edition. What the heck hmm. is this? It's uh, a reboot of an enormous role-playing game line from the 90s. Uh, Mutant Chronicles was started by Target Games and it was a competitor for the Games Workshop crown and they had three, uh, two video games, three board games, a card game called Doom Trooper in 16 languages, two editions of a role-playing game, um, uh, three novels, a series of comics, they've had a, a Hollywood film with Ron Perlman and a big pre-painted miniatures line by uh, Fantasy Flight Games in the last 10 years. So it was an enormous gaming brand and um, obviously disappeared when the parent company uh, went bankrupt at the end of the 90s and um, the brand's been a bit quiet. Obviously they had the movie out but there's been nothing really in the tabletop um, arena. So um, we picked up the license to relaunch it and um, bring it back. Why? <laughs> it's an awesome uh, storyline. It's it's um, it's a very it's exaggerated giant guns and giant shoulder pads, that, and um, it's sort of diesel punk sci-fi in the 25th century, and it looks amazing. They described it as techno fantasy in the um, in the 90s, which is kind of what it was. It was like this crazy combination of swords and guns and massive aliens breaking through from another dimension. But um, it, when you look at the styling, it was all kind of uh, post-war, uh, cool 40s and 50s style of ships and guns and tanks and um, and buildings. So it's so we would say now that's a kind of diesel punk style. And I just thought it's actually perfect for today's gaming audience, and it's it's very cinematic uh, as the storyline. Uh, but the rules were very crunchy at the beginning, and I knew we could do a great job to bring it up today. And I'd played the games back in the 90s. I'd played the card game and the board games, and um, I just loved it. So it was a no-brainer for me. It, now, is the book fully written? Have you written third edition RPG yet? Uh, no, it's being written at the moment. We've been playtesting for about six months with 400 groups, which is incredible. Uh, we've had a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people sign up, 
and um, we've been through three iterations. We've been through alpha 1.1, 1.2, 2.1, and we just hit 3.1, and that's when we got the wonderful Jay Little and Co. on board to lead the final stages of development. Okay. And we've How... also got. Um, sorry, I was going to say a lot of the uh, a lot of the writers have already started on all the content for the books. But of course, the great thing is the books already existed, and we've expanded on the storyline. So we're rewriting a lot of the material that's there and adding new material. So it's not like none of the stuff's been written. It all needs to be written from scratch. So it's it's going to make things a lot faster. Okay. About how complete would you say the book is at this point? Um, there's probably, a, I mean, we're talking a 400-page book now, and I know that some large chunks have been written, so we're probably not far off about 50% of the fluff, the kind of setting material, and, um, you know, Jay is about to unveil the latest beta test this weekend, and um, that, you know, that will put us probably somewhere around about the sort of 70 pages of rules, I'm guessing, and um, out, of, out of probably about, you know, 200 pages of rules as well, so it's, okay. uh, we, th we think that all that's going to go pretty quick. All right, what about the art? Now, uh, do you have access to all the art assets from previous yeah. Newton Chronicles? Well, yes and no. <laughs> the interesting thing is a lot of the art was done um, on, c on pretty old computer systems in the 90s, and um, I mean, that's, some of the art was... Um, uh, compressed with compression software that they don't even know what it is anymore and um, uh, you know you're talking really old PsyQuest drives and stuff so we don't always have access to a lot of the black and white art or the text files that kind of thing but that's that's easily to, easy to recreate now we do have access to very high res scans of all the Paul Bonner art and a lot of the other art and um, they're the real major uh, beautiful pieces because it's you know Paul Bonner's color art was very iconic for the Mutant Chronicles game and it made it really stand out and we're going to be using the most appropriate ones for the the best covers and we're commissioning some other covers but we've got tons and tons and tons of new color art that's going into all the books that is bringing to life the world and sort of aspects of the world that people have never seen before like spaceships for example and um, the cities and all kinds of stuff. What about editing? Do you have an editor lined up? We do. A uh, lovely lady called Laura um, and a fantastic guy called um, Matthew Combin, who's the layout um, designer as well. And um, he's been um, working alongside Michal Cross, our kind of main designer, uh, and he developed a great range of... Um, layout styles and, uh, and looks for the books, so it's already going to look cool, and people will get a glimpse of that when they see the beta download, which is going to be free from RPG Now in a couple of weeks' time. Nice. Now, you said that you've had 400 play testers. Has it been mm. reviewed anywhere? Where could I find that? No, I mean, it's we've not had a secret play test. There's been lots of people being very vocal about what they didn't like or what they liked, and it's, of course they're always more vocal about what they don't like. And, um, and we've done lots of surveys, and, and we've told people, go and talk to people about it. We've got nothing to hide. Rules aren't copyright in, in this day and age. You can't copy, you can copyright what you call the rule, but you can't copyright uh, the fact that you roll 2d6 or 5d20 or whatever it is. So um, uh, we've, we've said, look, just go and share this with people. Let's tell everyone this exists. So I think that's been good. We've done loads of surveys where we've gone into a lot of depth with the playtesters finding out what they liked, what they didn't like, what worked. And that's really helped us learn a lot. So by the time we got to the, the sort of draft beta where Jay Little has taken over, I think we had quite a solid um, sort of foundation for him to work from. All right. Now, part of the charm of Mutant Chronicles in the past is that it could be summed up in one word. Bleak. Now, humanity <laughs> devours itself from within as an implacable alien force invades, feeding off the internal conflict. Yeah. How does this edition reflect that vision, and are there new elements of hope in this version? It's. I mean, you've still got the corporations that at, at each other's throats. They're still attacking each other. While you know, for example, I was just looking at a piece of art where you've got some 
capital uh, gunships are going in to attack the Dark Legion citadel that appears on Mars, and Imperial shoot down most of the um, attack force. <laughs> Uh, for no re well, you don't know the reason. We know the reason. There's a kind of uh, deep plot there, but they're all constantly at each other's throats, trying to get one up over each other, even while the uh, Dark Legion are invading. And luckily, the Dark Legion are kind of fighting amongst themselves as well. They have all these skirmishes because you've got the five big apostles all kind of jockeying for for power and position. And uh, so it is very bleak. Um, it's very deadly, uh, but it's also very cinematic. You get these in incredible heroic last stands. You only need to look at Paul Bonner's art to see this sort of sense of, uh, you know, this sort of last stand of humanity. But and so it is. Um, you can. It's a bit like playing Call of Cthulhu. Actually, you can play Call of Cthulhu really dark and twisted, or you can play it kind of pulp and fun. And you know, you'll probably go mad still, but it or you'll do it in a in a really fun way, and you can be a bit too fisted with it. And that's how we did Act and Cthulhu. We gave you two approaches, and I think um, uh, you'll see when there's a lot of new material around the Dark Legion that's very dark, and uh, so there's going to be ways to play this quite in a very sinister, sort of investigative, um, a cult style way, and there's, you're going to be able to play just crash bang wallop, big battles, great fun. Nice. Um, now, you're probably already aware that the original game has a pretty loyal following. Uh, you already mentioned the giant shoulder pads, uh, Megacorp, yeah. Propaganda, uh, the gritty setting, questions about the meta plots like the original car Cardinals and Heretical Ascensions, and they're all things that the fans of the original game are going to love. Mm. How true are you staying to those design decisions, and, and where would you say that you're deviating? Uh, w with the story, for example, we've not... Uh, taken anything away. So what we did is we put all the storyline together from all the books and there were some contradictions. So we have summarized the key points and um, worked out what the contradictions were, proposed the, um, the final storyline, we filled in the gaps. There were a lot of holes in the story that weren't explained that um, were left hanging and we've, we've now got this one central plot that runs over the course of about a million years, biz bizarrely enough. Uh, it's obviously focused on about a thousand years of human history when you know they, uh, they evacuate Earth and then you get these two big invasions of the Dark Legion. So that's where we're really focused. But we know what happened a million years ago to to uh, bring about the sort of events of um, this sort of focal point of history. And so we've got all that storyline worked out. From an art perspective, we've very much kept with the style that kind of bleak, um, you know, Peter Bergting's black and white bleak images that were spread throughout the books I think were quite you know well known as the sort of some of the best imagery we've kept the sort of um, you know they're very much like heavy metal rock you know Iron Maiden covers of, my, of uh, albums you know in terms of the Paul Bonner art uh, shove a few massive shoulder pans and a huge gun and, and about a thousand screaming necromutants and you've, you've kind of got the picture so the um, you know, that style is still there. I love it. And it's it's what makes Mutant Chronicles Mutant Chronicles. If you take the shoulder pads away, if you take the exaggerated styling and you know, everything's bigger than it needs to be. The engines are massive, the guns are huge, the monsters are, are crazy. If you take that away, it's not Mutant Chronicles. You might as well just have a some other, you know, uh, um, sci fi game. So Nice. Now the art of course is very inspirational. But uh, what about setting tone? Are you giving any advice to the, the GMs for setting the tone of this game appropriately? Yeah. And how's that working? Well, actually, there's a good example is that the um, Misha Thomas, who's the Swedish writer of Cold and Dark, he's working on the Dark Legion material at the moment, and he is writing a guide for how to use each creature that you might encounter or, which t or each sort of... Um, sort of force of the Dark Legion. So there'll be tactical guides on, you know, they don't just all attack you. Some of them might try and seduce you. Some of them might try and um, bribe you or blackmail you. Some of them might try and ambush you. It's not all just screaming monsters with guns, which is kind of what the old game came across as. So we've, we've really embellished a lot of detail about the creatures. There'll be a lot of GM advice on how to communicate this styling. How, what is, how do you get across the diesel punk style to, to your gamers? Because it's obviously great having this 400-page book 
but how do you get that into people's heads and show them? We're going to do some other things like um, sets of villain cards. So you're going to have cards with the stats on for human villains and um, protagonists, as well as the Dark Legion creatures. So that um, and you'll have the, they'll have their tactics on there as well, kind of keywords and things, as well as their stats. You're going to have cards for locations, which show a great piece of art. And so you can flash this up to the players and go, you know, this is where you're going. And there'll be a piece of sort of descriptive text to read them as they enter, for example. So that would give uh, new GMs some you know, ideas about how to ex explain things. And that's actually useful for a GM because if you're thinking, you know what, I really want to have an adventure tonight. I just need some inspiration. So draw three location cards. That's where you're going tonight. So, um, so there'll be a lot of help for GMs. And the symmetry dice pool that we have is also a great mechanic for helping GM structure their gameplay as well. Interesting. The symmetry dice pool, is that new? Uh, it's been in the playtests um, for the last few versions. It's basically a pool of dice, and you get these cool D6. We use them for damage dice as well. They've, um, um, they're not weird dice. They've got one to six on it. And um, uh, but they've got a couple of symbols on the, on the one and the two side uh, at the moment. That might change. And um, uh, the symmetry pool is a pool of dice that grows in front of the GM as the players um, do certain things. And, for example, that might be as they buy extra dice to use in their skill check. It might be when they roll a 20. The GM gets dice from various you know, physical locations or certain creatures or villains, perhaps. And those dice are spent to drive the dramatic action to um, uh, trigger special powers and uh, do all kinds of unusual stuff. And we've actually loosened the, um, the idea of how, they, how they're spent, and people are going to find out about that this weekend uh, when they see the initial beta. And it's actually a lot more flexible than it was in the last playtest. Very cool. All right. Well, um, Chris, I'm going to switch up on you. We've got some questions in the wings here from people who are okay. interested in this. So I'm going to uh, select voted up. Joe Figueroa uh, has a question about how did Modifius decide to fill in the story gaps in the original RPG? I think we've, we've dealt with this a little bit earlier, but is there anything more yeah. you want to add there? Um, well, it, it was one of the first times that anyone had actually really put the entire storyline together. There were some obvious points that um, clashed, and so we made a call on which was the, and we usually went with the original story rather than the new storyline that had been created, or where it just didn't make sense, we, um, we uh, changed. Um, the, uh, the gaps that have been filled in have been based around a central plot that is to do with mutation. So um, the original game implied that it, it was about mut the mutants on Earth, um, and, and, and in a sense, it was the original game that Target did was Mutant, and that Mutant Chronicles took it into space, and they left the mutants on Earth. And in Mutant Chronicles, you get this nuclear war, a big kind of um, lot of radiation on Earth and plagues that cre creates lots of mutation. But we've taken that forward into a much stronger theme. So mutation is going to become a more and more important part of the storyline. So we started off with this kind of backbone of a plot that we've developed that, as I mentioned, starts a million years ago. And this is all connected with the Dark Legion. And we've used that as our guide to then fill in those gaps and go, what, what would make sense here? What makes sense with the storyline? What um, grows the storyline? Because we're not changing the storyline. We're adding to it. So um, we're, not, we're not explaining something away with a completely different event that never you know, that um, disrupt, disrupts the rest of the story that's already been created. So it's obviously you've got to be quite careful when you do this. It's a bit like, um, you know, it's, it's, you're filling in, in dots on a massive painting to ensure that the whole thing looks like a great picture. And, uh, you know, it's been a bit tricky. And we're still doing it. We're still looking at, you know, we've been looking at the 700-year period between the two Dark Legion Wars and some of the key events and trying to, We've been working out why they happened, you know, like the Black Rot, for example. Um, you know, the, when the Cardinal, uh, one of the Cardinals, uh, loses the plot and uh, goes a bit mental. 
Well, how does that happen? So will we know now? And uh, that's all been signed off by Paradox Entertainment, who own the brand. Very interesting. All right. I'm going to hit you with another question. This should, should be quick. Uh, Lorenzo Barea asks, uh, the RPG, will it be translated and distribu distributed throughout Europe? Uh, at the moment, it's going to be in English. Uh, we've got partners who are we're going to be working with on all the major translations, Italian, Spanish, German, French, uh, even looking at Portuguese for um, Brazil, which is a fantastic growing gaming market. So um, uh, possibly even Russian. So um, yes, we're looking at translations. It's realistically they will happen later on uh, once the core game has come out because it needs to be, when you start doing a translation, it's such an enormous amount of work, it's got to be the final version of the book. And even once you get the first book out, there's always something, you know, there's always some small errors like, you know, we have with Act and Cthulhu, there's a few things you spot that you go, right, well, we're going to fix that for the next print run. Nothing major. But it, you want to make sure that when the translators start, they've got the most perfect copy. So I would imagine translations would start in the autumn for um, releases in different languages in 2015. That's exciting. All right. Uh, and then one last question we've got out here from uh, from fans. Well, this is from David uh, Reichgeld. I'm sorry, David, if I messed up your last name. Will there be something like a fan license system to encourage fan-made RPG stuff uh, without getting into trouble? Uh, it's a good question. We are planning to do a, a system where... Um, and it's something that we're working on for Modifius, um, and it's called the Modifians, which is a community program we're developing where you can submit ideas, and we develop this around Act and Cthulhu. It's a, a website. You're going to be able to submit ideas for any of our projects, and um, uh, it, that can be a, an idea for a creature, a new gun, a, a whole storyline, a, a um, adventure, whatever it is you want. It can be as finished or as basic. The community can then vote that up or down, and the top 10 at the moment, might be 20, uh, but the top 10 will um, uh, be published in a, uh, a probably a quarterly um, PDF and then possibly a combined book, so the best, the best content. And the people who supply that content will get paid for what they've written. So that's the basic concept at the moment. Now, in terms of people wanting to be able to just, I, I don't care about that. I just want to put out a, you know, I just want to write a fan adventure and let other people download it. We're looking at how we can do that and give them a simple structure uh, because the, the best, we do want to encourage people to create stuff in the world and, um, and share it. That's great. We're also, we're also giving them the platform that if they think they're good enough, they can earn some credits and some money doing it as well from the community and actually uh, you know, get something uh, as a result. All right. Uh, and then what about uh, media? We have another question from Lorenzo, uh, which is, so uh, what about short films dedicated to Mutant Chronicles? Is that, would, you, would you see that as a problem? Uh, well, that's really down to paradox because we have the rights to the role-playing game. And uh, okay. we're obviously doing some T-shirts and other merchandising around the role-playing game for them, um, which they've given us permission for. Uh, War, the Prodos guys have the miniatures rights, and of course, they're you know the more successful we all are, they're going to be looking for other companies to take on other rights. And you know, who knows? Maybe there'll be other media down the line. You know, um, to if if we're successful, then there's no reason there shouldn't be other content, you know, comic books, films, novels, whatever. All right. Now, uh, back to a couple more questions here before we wrap up our normal fund or fail. Uh, what happens if this does fail? You're funded. You're fully funded. Your goal yeah. is 11,000 pounds. You, at this point, at the point of this recording, you have 620 backers. You've raised seven, 75, over 75,000 pounds. Yeah. Uh, what happens if it fails? Uh, well, if for some reason we don't fund all the books we've said we wanted to fund, we're still making them anyway because it's part of the range. And, of course, the Kickstarter lets you pay the writers now to write them now, just get on with it, let's get them ready. And uh, 
the um, um, they'll they'll uh, when you've funded them through Kickstarter, you can bring them out sooner, and obviously all the backers get them uh, at the same time. Now, if we don't fund certain books through the Kickstarter, so you know, for example, we've got three campaigns, and there's the Dark Eden setting. It looks like, according, you know, based on our projections, we should easily fund those, and we're already planning a bunch of other uh, products and books that we can um, unlock for players as well to really grow the universe. But if for some reason those aren't funded, they'll go into the normal production schedule. And for retail anyway, we wouldn't bring all these books out at once because the shops couldn't possibly stock them all in the first month. We'd be bringing out the core book and maybe two or three guides and the campaign in month one. And then every month we'd be bringing out another guide, maybe a campaign. So we'd be staggering the releases over the course of several months because that's when the shops can support you properly. Because if, the, if, the, if you give them five books, they'll buy one. You know, if you give them one, they'll buy one probably. So we've got to take that, you know, that approach. But yeah, they're all happening. Um, it will just be, take a little bit longer. All right. And then, what's the best possible outcome for the time that the project has remaining? Uh, well, on the basis that we were we're taking roughly about the same money as Acton Cthulhu did, uh, we had a bigger start. We had a twenty-five grand first day. Uh, we're at uh, in three weeks, we're at, uh, in 21 days, we're at 75 grand, and last time we, we took, um, I think, 60 days or 50 days to reach that. So we looks like we're funding twice as fast, um, and we did 90,000 in, in the last six days of Acting Cthulhu. So it's quite possible we could do anywhere upwards of 200,000, and I would imagine that we would actually qu unlock quite a large number of books and miniatures and all kinds of extra cool stuff. You know, obviously we're looking at, we want to bring in some big name cover artists to do cover art for the books that Paul Bonner's art just isn't suitable for. So for a good example would be L Lunar and Heretic's book, uh, which um, there really isn't a, um, a suitable cover for that possibly. Or actually, actually there is, there's a great shot, but there's the uh, Mutants and Heretic's book uh, which uh, would be fun. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff we think we can do, and we're we're fairly confident that we're gonna gonna give all the backers way more value than they could possibly imagine. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate Chris Birch. I appreciate your time. Uh, again, this is for uh, it's on Kickstarter. It is Mutant Chronicles Third Edition RPG. The funding for this project ends on Sunday, March 9th, 2014, at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so thanks for, for coming on, Chris, and, and talking through us about this project. I'm very excited for you. Yeah. And uh, thanks to Arnold Cassell, uh, the Kicksnarter Google Plus, Kicksnarker <laughs> Google Plus community, uh, Adam Robichaux and Indie Plus uh, for all of the questions they've submitted, and also thanks to those of you who are on the Q&A. Uh, we will see how this fund uh, this funded project goes. It looks like they're definitely going to raise more than enough money. We'll see if he unlocks everything all the way up to see what's the highest uh, pledge, uh, the unlockable that you have right now out there. Uh, at I think the moment, it's, it's uh, 105, I think, it goes up to. But there's this thing that says more coming soon. Oh, yeah, there's plenty more coming. There's another three campaigns. There's a couple more guidebooks. There's the massive Dark Eden setting book. Um, and all kinds of extra goodies, because people, I mean, everyone will know all the extra cool stuff that we unlocked for Acts and Cthulhu, and that's just a, just a, a, a glimpse of what we can do for this. All right. Well, I wish you the best of luck, Chris, and thanks again for being thanks on Thunderfail. Cheers.